Okay, I will be presenting uh, 10 research-based guidelines. Um, and the overview of my talk is like this, I'll introduce, which is now, right now, already happening. Uh, I'll give some examples of my own research. Uh, then I'll start with the first five guidelines. Uh, then we'll have an intermezzo, and then the other five will come that makes together 10. Um, I'm very much indebted to Khan. He was inspiring me, and I was also thinking, it's very interesting how he does his handwriting and how his handwriting then appears on the screen. And it's so daring that you have your poor handwriting and you make your errors and you scribble through and you leave it. It's so daring. It's very personal and it's very different from how I would be doing it. And I saw that other people are also thinking this is not how you should be doing. For example, uh, Jostein, he's doing it in a Khan Academy way, but much neater. It's really in right lines, it's, there's no errors, and if he makes an error, he will redo it. I'm sure you do. Um, other people are thinking, I should show my face, and I also should be showing more graphics. It's not so much the handwriting, but it's more showing pictures, like this girl she was doing, and I was working with her. So there are so many different styles, and it's not only styles in how it looks like, but it's also different styles in what is the thing you are presenting. Will you be presenting more with pictures? Will you be presenting more with ab abstract mathematics? So there's so many choices to make um, that I started to think about that. The background is that we have three different actors here. We have, on the one hand, the teachers, these ones, the teachers. The teacher's role is changing. The teacher is more a helpful guide the teacher is getting more to the background. We have the students. The students, they are changing. They want more their own independence. They want more resources. They want to look up at things on the internet. And then we have, of course, the technology. The technology is changing. So these three factors are interacting and they're giving a new dynamic to education, which makes everything very complicated. My question was, what are good instructional videos? That's how I started a number of years ago. This one I'm jumping, because you know the terminology. I started with a group of designers, and we started to create web-based lessons. I personally was the designer of a lesson series on logics. There was another one on differential equations. There was another one on... So we were designing, it should all be web-based. Do away with the book. And what we did was something like this. We had a big screen, we had chapters, and then there would be a starting video to introduce the chapter, and thereafter there would be exercises. So this was very much on introducing a topic. We also had it sometimes differently, that we had some introductory text. You can see this is logics and this is truth tables. And then after the introduction, there would be a worked example. How do you fill in such a truth table, and then there would be coming more exercises. What we also tried was, how does it look like if we, and this is not streamed video, this is a teacher, we asked him to teach twice for 15 minutes about a certain subject. We had 20 kids, we split the kids in two groups, 10 groups, uh, 10 kids, 10 kids. So what we did, he was teaching for 15 minutes to 10 children, then we sent the kids out, we asked the other kids to come in, then asked him to teach again. And so we thought those two times 15 minutes, we cut it together and then we get a very nice eight minute movie. Thereafter, we asked Marco, the guy, to change his shirt as if it was on another day. We asked those 10 kids again and he would be teaching another topic and then kids changing again. So there we had three different topics, it looks like it's very different, but it was all shot on one day. And then we just learned that if a teacher is teaching to the audience, it's not interesting for those people behind the camera. So it was very expensive, and we learned something very simple from it. And what we learned is you have different videos, they are introducing videos, they are worked examples, and sometimes you have those videos which are more on the historical background kind of thing. Um, it did not help me much in my research, so we had to do more research. Um, this research was that we were going to interview the audience, what do they think about videos? 
So we created some videos. We selected some very typical looking videos and we asked the participants, teachers, students, and also designers, what do you think? So our instrument for research looked like this. That we had videos, of course, the big <laughs> typical Khan Academy. We had a guy standing in front of a board. We had a very mathematical, puristic talking as if it was just from the book. And we had a very friendly guy talking with a very accent from the south of the Netherlands. And it was shown, so the full video was shown. It was not just a screenshot. And we asked the participants their opinions about it. Um, everybody was saying, this is too colorful. It's nice to see a face, but it's not so nice if it's my own teacher. <laughs> everybody was saying the very formal thing, it's as if from the book, give me the book. And they were saying, somebody with an accent, if it's not my own accent, please don't. Um, so there we learned something. Uh, we also learned that students were saying, just give me the how, get me as fast as possible to the answer. I want to do the exam next week, and then I want to forget about it. So this is kind of an advice that you get from our target groups and that we're not going to take seriously. But of course, it's good to know. Uh, they want to see the face. Students also like to see that if you have a text from a book, just copy the text from the book literally. Don't go and copy it by hand then again because it will look differently. The formal thing should remain the formal thing and then the working, that can be by hand. The other, uh, the other study then I, we did afterwards was an intervention just like uh, Olaf was describing. You use those videos and then you look what's happening. Uh, we did not measure it in a strict way with a control group, but we looked like what are the students perceiving. Um, these are how the videos looked like. A little bit colors, but not too much. And here we have some frequency counts. There were several videos and we saw that the first video that was really watched a lot then there is some dwindling in the statistics. And then in the end, the hardest part of the course, that again is watched a lot. So there, there, there is some, 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 some behavior behind it. That in the beginning, st students are serious. And in the end, they're serious. Um, we also asked them about the minutes. And seven minutes was kind of optimal. And uh, they were all saying that it really, really, really helped them. Okay, um, I've been studying lots of studies and you may take a picture of this one. No, okay. <laughs> I've also been looking at uh, lots of other studies and there I'm having some overlap with Olaf, but here is my first five guidelines. The very first one is, of course, the mathematics should be correct and you'll be surprised to see what kind of little errors there are for example, this is a very nice video. It has been corrected in the meantime, but there is a plus minus error. It comes if designers make a lot of series, uh, a series of the same kind of videos, then they tend to use the old videos or the old PowerPoint for the next one. And then it was pluses all over in the first video and then there are some minuses in the next one. Um, this is another one. This is about logarithm. And on num minute 37, you see logarithm positive tal a log a are the talet that we are uphöhe. And then three seconds later, suddenly something happened in the layout, but there were some numbers suddenly, whoops, going up. And the speaker keeps on talking because she's busy there with the 10 and she continues there. But it's quite disturbing that suddenly there is something in the layout happening. This can easily be avoided by just doing the video again. Second guideline, that is animation and narration. It's action and voice that can be put into a video. The background to it is that in our videos, we appeal to two senses. It's the sound and it's the vision. 
both are activating different parts in our brains. Neurologically, there are different e electricity wires going on. And if you coordinate that nicely, then they'll use a lot of activities in the brain. If you only activate one of them and keep the other one numb, then it's less effective. So people learn if both sensory systems are activated, graphics are very appealing to the eye. That's why I put this picture there, because pictures are better than words. Um, words are better retained when you speak them out and you hear them resonating in your ear than when you see them written. Um, but when you see a video and it's a blank screen and you hear a voice talking, talking, talking for more than 50 minutes, you don't appreciate the video anymore. You want to see some moving. This is what you, why you are looking at video. Um, this system is not appealed when it's exactly the same information going into those channels. So when the spoken words are exactly reading what the text is saying, it's exactly going synchronous, then there is no activity in the brain anymore. So the voice should be saying something which is in parallel to what you see, but it should not be exactly the same thing. Okay, guideline number three. The space and how it looks like. I was already talking about uh, <laughs> um, but oh, this is a lot of text. It's space, that's where I'm talking now about space, and how it looks like. You want to see some maybe color pictures. Okay, here's my picture. Um, this is a screen example of somebody who had everything on the screen and wanted to include it while she did not need it. She only needed this part. But then she did not plan well why, where to put the x-axis. She had to move it a bit up, but then that part would disappear. So this kind of planning of your space, but she also has everything around it, which is kind of useless. She even has her um, uh, recording, and at the end of the video, you see the mouse going up and say, plop, at the end. <laughs> so in a way, it's, it's kind of showing everything, but it's not needed. It may distract the reader, the, 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 the audience. This is another example I just took from um, YouTube, some examples. Here you see that somebody took the camera in portrait while the screen is in landscape. So you lose all that space left and right, which could be used to activate your audience. Here the spacing is nice, here the spacing is nice, here the spacing is a bit awkward, and here the spacing is gorgeous. <laughs> Do you manage to see? Okay. Um, the space is also that in mathematics, classically, when, for example, you had a, a theorem in geometry, you remember, you had those angles, and then you had to prove something over here, and then you had the writing, and when you had the writing, you always had to look like, oh, angle ABC, where is ABC? All right, and so you go up and down in the reading. That's how classically in geometry we were writing. Then you have angle DBA, oh, where's D? <laughs> oh, yeah. So you keep on going up and down between the text and the graphics. That was how we did it in 1920, in 1950, in 1980. But nowadays we don't need it anymore because you can have all the information pop, 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 pop here around where you want it to be. And that is kind of planning. Okay, it doesn't show so easily here, but you get my point. Oh yeah, the looks. Handwriting is an issue. How neatly do you want to have it? Of course, it, doesn't, it, it can be personal, but it can be awful at the same time. This is really, I mean, I'm just, it's not so hard to find on the internet, this thing. You want to see it. You want to be able to read it. This space. Okay. Guideline number four is it's about how is learning happening. Learning is something where you want to be together. We are humans, and so we want to be more informal. It has been sh really shown that if you're more informal, 
students are learning better. If it's a human voice, students are learning better than with a machine voice. And they want to see the face. They want to see with whom they are. So it's kind of this community in which you are there. Um, not reading up, but having this conversation style. The handwriting, it is considered important, although neat. But students prefer handwriting over typing. And also an enthusiastic person like Yuri, who was kind of entertainment. That's really getting into some engagement and not create this distance. So that's this participatory look on learning that you can put into a video. And then the other one is to adapt to the audience. What is the background of the audience? What kind of resources do they have? If they have a certain book, should we just say, look into the book? Um, they have a certain pre-knowledge, they have certain resources, they have a certain language. They also have certain slowness. And sometimes it may feel that your video is too slow, but for the studio, student, it may already be too fast. Dialects, if it is from the student, it's fine. If it's not, then it's not so fine. And of course, this teacher being in front in the video, it may remind the students of earlier frustrations and that's why they don't want to see the teacher. Okay. No? That was the football. Is there sound? How do we have sound here? Please, technology guys. No, we don't have sound. Where is the sound? Where did I mute it? Right. Let's try it again. Hmm. Okay. You should all just go and look for Vi Heart. Big advice by heart. It is a must for everybody who wants to study how to make um, videos. Um, by heart, she works like this. She has the camera in between her knees and she shoots uh, what she has in her hands and she draws and she doodles. It's very um, associative, it's very fast and it's very funny. By the way, because she shoots her hands, she puts makeup on her hands. And so uh, she, she, she every now and then she just pats her hands and uh, <laughs> she's uh, good. OK, I'll keep it uh, fast. Um, guideline number six is really the request from all students. All students are saying, we don't want to waste our time on too many us or we just want to keep it short. We want to learn as fast as possible. We want to get it done. So the information must be streamlined. And that's, of course, quite contradictory. Because on the one hand, we want to give them lots of information. And my guidelines are also saying, give them lots of information. And on the other hand, it must be as short as possible. They want it to be clear. They don't want extra things. They don't want banners. They don't want. Um, phones ringing, and of course, the shortness of the video depends on other things. If, for example, the space is well planned, then the video already can be shortened. And also, as we've been seeing uh, this morning, if you trial it and you do it again, the next time the video will be more effective, more efficient, and much better. So trialing of the video will then help. Um, number seven, it's the head and tail. And head and tail means there should be a clear beginning, there should be a clear end. You may have noticed that I was in group number three. We started with, we have a shower. And we ended with, that was the shower. So there is a head to it, there is a tail to it. And it means that students really know that the people have been thinking about what to say, that there's a goal in it. So head and tail has to do with your goal orientation. 
And this goal, it can be promoted. That, of course, also has to do with being a bit enthusiastic about what you do. But the big picture, to give an overview, is very important for students to see where it will be going. So the immediately start to get into the solution, the immediately start to get step-by-step -step things, that does not help the student. They really need to get some feet on the ground, being clear on the goal to start with, and also being clear about where the goal has been achieved helps the students. And so segmentation helps, not fragmentation. This, this, this goal orientation also is reflected in the title. If you know what your video is about, then it should be reflected in the title. It also makes it easier for the student to go back. So for example, uh, the shower method for um, algebraic expressions will help the students much more than saying this was about chapter 4.4. I'm almost there. Oh yeah, signaling. Guiding the eye. Lead the eye that lead the mind. As a person who watches the video, you're sometimes looking like, at which corner are they? And so this signaling is very important. It's also important to foreground vital parts and lifting it from the nose, which is elsewhere. And in video, you can sometimes push something forward and then afterwards you can delete it again. It's just like we were doing on the whiteboard. You, you write something and you wipe it out again. Uh, th so the spotlighting is important. And it also it gives cues to the readers and the audience what is important. Um, one example is, of course, to highlight some steps that you're making before you're writing down the A times minus B. Um, I'm really getting fast. Yeah, I'll manage. Number nine. That's the activation. Now, this is very hard because we've been already seeing video is one direction. There is video going into the, how can you do something with that audience? How can you activate? Well, you can. Um, there is, of course, the user control that they should be able to start, pause, and stop, and replay. Uh, if there is the feature possible that they can do fast forward, it will help certainly some students because the alternative could be that instead of fast forward wording, they'll be stopping it. If they want to fast forward, it means they're kind of a little bit bored already, but they can already fast forward. If they're too much bored, then they'll end up. To make pauses also helps, because a pause can be also the moment when the student will be pausing to rerun it again. Asking questions without immediately answering these also activates it asks for something, it asks for it, so it's quite directive. There are some uh, videos then who have a, that, have, that have a couch potato button. The couch potato button means that halfway the video is stopped. And those students who were watching your video, they were bored, they went for a cup of coffee, they'll be returning back and the video is stopped. It means they must press a certain button before the video continues. Um, so that's, it is a terminology, couch potato button. And there is another piece of software that edits the video. And I'm going to show you, it looks like this. There is the video, but the YouTube line has been removed. It's not complete. And there is a question which first needs to be answered before the video can go on. And there is another question that needs to be answered before it can go on. So here the video was stopped, and then there is a question. The student should first reply to the question, and only then they can continue and see the remainder of those three minutes of the video. This software w in which your video can be embedded, it gives them a lot of statistics. You can, for example, see which of the students have been watching. You can also see how much of the assignments they've been doing that were embedded. And then you can see individually for each student um, how, much, m how many times did he watch. So this student, he watched the beginning only one time. Then there was a question and he started kind of doubt. And this part 
was watched five times by the student. And then he got towards this question he got there, and then he could continue until the final ends. So there is some statistics measurement where you see the intensity and the difficulty, and you can also see like what kind of answers they were giving to. So this is to activate the audience. And now my final guideline number 10, support conceptual understanding of mathematics. We don't want just to be mathematics a set of rules. Students will think mathematics is a set of rules and they need to remember thousands of rules. No, mathematics is an activity, it's interconnected, and if you get more of an overview, if you get more of a conceptual understanding, you need to remember less. And we know that retention is much and much better if we organize some conceptual understanding. Now this guideline, it contradicts the other ones. Because making it more conceptual, it means you need more time. You need to make, as in your video, to create more space for more backgrounds, for more pictures. So there's a lot of ways in which you can enhance conceptual understanding. For example, um, by giving more context, by using different representations, graphs, um, by not immediately jumping into the symbols um, to include intuitions, not, and this is a repetition, to immediately start with step-by-step -step instructions but give main points, make interconnections, strengthen the whys and the reflection and use questions. All right, uh, should be going some examples. Yeah, there is a nice example. I mean, this is about showing uh, graphs which go together with the symbols. This one is a guy who's explaining logarithms and he's really making different distinctions between the exponential form and the logarithmic form. This is a guy who's explaining about fractions and he's using graphs to explain those fractions. And this was the overview. Thank you very much. I have a summary of my 10 guidelines, but I only bought uh, 20 copies while the audience is much bigger. So I have for everybody, but not for the OER people. <laughs> then we will manage the OER people, they can get later. <laughs>